So the opening slide says that we should think about this stranded asset issue in terms of Goldilocks. Um, that there are two numbers which are probably not relevant. One is that there's an enormous amount of hydrocarbon in the ground. I, just, I think peak oil was a major distraction. It was an exercise in wishful thinking that somehow we would not have a serious climate problem because we would run out of hydrocarbons in the ground. It's not what the peak oil people said, but it was how it was internalized by the public. So there are, most of what's in the ground will never become stranded because it will never become an asset in the first place. On the other hand, it's probably right when the oil companies and gas companies and coal companies say what we actually call assets today, reserves, which are ready to be produced economically. Most of that probably will be produced. I just <laughs> um, did you hear me before? Am I probably? Okay. All right. I didn't do anything. Somebody changed the setting. All right. So that there, so not much of what is in the reserve today's whoop, reserves category will become stranded. So what could become stranded? It's something in the middle. It's something with time horizons of perhaps 20 to 60 years. This point was made this morning. I thought I discovered something, but of course that never happens. You always have other people finding the same things out. But the exploration investments um, are going to be the ones which are which are uh, under the under the searchlight. Uh, companies will be asked why they think they can produce something 50 years from now in a different environment where climate change has become completely much more serious, which will feed back immediately. And this, I think, is why I call this the scrimmage line, which I realize is an American football word, is where each play starts. But a scrum is not unlike what happens about a second after the scrimmage line play begins in American football. So it's where the play starts, and the play will start around the investments in exploration. Um, and then we will have, indeed, a, uh, a very serious dialogue about what should be what makes sense? And that will, that will be, a, I think that will be the pacing item. No, no. This is something we certainly should discuss. My goal today is to start or promote a discussion. I don't have final answers to any of this. Um, so the, there's, there's a picture there that I took myself out of a helicopter flying over the, uh, the uh, Alberta oil sands about 10 years ago now. Some of the largest shovels in the world are pulling uh, this sand, which is 15% hydrocarbon, and they boil the hydrocarbon away, and that becomes an oil reserve resource. And it's, a, it's my, my index of the enormous amount of hydrocarbon in the ground. Uh, it's not a knowable number how much there really is, but that hasn't stopped a few bold people, particularly Mr. Robner, who works at IASA, who's over several times has come back to this subject. Westmates said approximately 2,000 times the rate at which we're using 2,000 years today's fossil fuel use would account for the hydrocarbons we might some put in principle develop an enormous amount that I think is, um, is uh, I have the number, but many times the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere right now, 20 times. I think. So um, the summary sentence which I like is that fossil fuels are so abundant that even for a weak climate target, attractive fossil fuel will be left in the ground. You all know that. This meeting is about. And then I drew these two arrows for myself to try to understand what a stranded asset is. It isn't a stranded asset until it's an asset. It isn't an asset until it's had some investment. And so it's this two-step process that we identify over and over again. And then when I tried to think of some examples of stranded assets from away from the oil and gas and coal world, I came up with examples that didn't quite fit some of the earlier talks this morning. Water infrastructure becomes stranded when an aquifer has become depleted. It's a physical event, it's not a technology event, it's not an economic event. Wildlife sanctuary is stranded when a species of endangered owl that it is protected goes extinct. Another science driven stranded, stranded, strandedness. Schools can be stranded when birth rates fall. And I couldn't resist this. A strand is stranded when a government, perhaps anticipating sea level rise, forbids development. So stranding is a very broad category activity. And that's worth remembering that. And I, and I jumped into this. I haven't written about this. I haven't quite thought about it. I hadn't, I hadn't quite talked. I hadn't talked about this, written about this before. I just wandered into this and tried to come up with some ideas. But I did think it was worth, particularly with a few Americans here, 
calling attention to a, a key word in, in a related subject in the U.S. It comes over and over again, which is called the takings. And many of you would not know that word, I think, but it comes from a, uh, the Fifth Amendment to the Bill of Rights, which, in the Bill of Rights, which says, no, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. The government is in, in, intrudes upon the private sector, typically private land, for example, to build a road. And that is called the takings, and then it has to be compensated. And I think it's in the Bill of Rights because you Brits must have been doing something contrary to that to us poor <laughs> colony guys um, in around the 19, uh, 1770. So anyway, that isn't quite the same thing, and it's interesting to think about how it's different, but let me not, let me not take time up with that. But it is the way a lot of this argument has occurred, about, particularly about environmental regulation, forbid development on a beach. That's called the beach owners can, has gone to court to say that's a taking to want a compensation, and there's a huge amount of case law about that, which some of you may know something about. Then we go to the what are the what are the operative what's the operative vocabulary today? And carbon budgets is certainly one of the critical words. Carbon budgets and unburnable carbon, I think, are the two new phrases that are very very evocative and get uh, get a lot of the conversation. And carbon budgets were just scratching the surface. Um, some of you are, are, are quite a bit further along than many, but I think you'll concede that. We haven't had a very serious discussion. Carbon budgets in particular are time independent. The idea is that the carbon dioxide molecule stays so long in the atmosphere, it doesn't matter whether we put it there in 2020 or 2040. So we have a choice between those two in principle. Whose, whose fossil energy comes out of the ground? Is it all going to be Saudi? Is it going to be, uh, how's that going to work? Used where? It's not just where it comes out, but where it gets burned, which is not the same place, of course. Which countries? For what purposes are we going to trade off the uh, the first the first uh, fossil energy use in a, in a poor city slums versus airplanes? And then which fossil fuel? Where well, there is one place where some science science-based person can make an observation, which is when we take carbon out of the ground, hydrogen comes with it. Hydrogen gets burned to get you energy without any carbon atoms. So the more the hydrogen comes out with the carbon, the, the better it is in terms of the score of energy per unit of carbon. Which, preferent, which, is a, which preferentially advantages natural gas versus coal. The strongest competition among the fossil energy uh, options is very strongly skewed toward natural gas and away from coal. When you talk about budgets or carbon prices, which is essentially the same thing. Who makes these decisions we haven't decided? And, uh, and we're, in, we're in new territory. I've tried to put some numbers around carbon budgets. In particular, the IPCC and its most recent working group, three report, actually it's working group one report, went all the way to three degrees and talked about the carbon budgets that go with one, two, and three degrees Celsius. And although in principle this isn't a linear curve, it's linear for that, linear enough for that for those three degrees to, to make it a mnemonic and learn what they actually said, which rounding off some is that 1,600 billion tons of CO2 goes with each of the first three degrees of warming of the planet relative to pre-industrial times, average surface temperature, and we have a pretty much put one degree away already. We burn one degree of hydrocarbons. So burning again as much gets us to two degrees. That is the target that Paris discusses. But let's include three degrees in the picture for the sake of argument. And that would be burning twice as much as we burn already. Um, there is an attempt there to also to quantify the uncertainties in all of this. If you aim for two degrees, there's about one chance in six that you'll get three, you'll be unlucky. Conversely, if you aim for three degrees, there's about one chance in six that you'll be lucky and get a two degree outcome. That's a lot of uncertainty. The uncertainty is in our inadequate understanding of how the Earth works. The positive feedbacks involved in clouds, forests, and ice, those are the three big ones. And we simply don't know very well, as these one six indicate, uh, what really is going to happen. The Earth will tell us over the next decades how it works, um, and that will be one of the main things that, I, in my view, is going to determine how, how quickly we react to the climate problem, how scared we get. We will learn from the Earth, and that will be buried in the next couple of decades of, of conversation that it amounts to burning carbon and seeing what happens. So the two, the two blue 
light blue drawings there are a two degree and a three degree target abstracted again. Some of you know I like straight lines. And um, I call it the Hubbard Peak equivalent. We go up to the middle, we're right at the middle right now and come down the back side just as we've been going up the front side. That's a two degree world. It's consistent with statements like that we should have half the carbon emissions in the 40 years that we have right now. That's what that picture does. Three degrees just slots in. This is 1,600 million tons. 40 years times 40 tons, 40 billion tons per year is the rectangle that is the difference between two degrees and three degrees. It's 40 years extra. If you're in the exploration and production business, those 40 years are not very comforting because you're making decisions now that that'll be for production in that time period, and you expected a bigger, a bigger fossil fuel world than that. So in my view, and it was in the first slide, I want to say it again, is it's the production decision, exploration decisions, what will be where we have a lot of the conversation. We don't know really where any of that is dangerous. Um, we don't know it well enough to be able to say that three degrees is much more dangerous than two. So it, it's, it's, I find that when you talk to fossil energy people, and you say, look, three degrees already is, is operative, this material, as an objective. They pay attention because they've sort of written off two degrees, and I think from a, from a in terms of having conversations, it's useful to bring that in. Um, I, I also, so I have a, a, a next slide which is, says $100 a ton of CO2 on top of it. It's the one that I find people particularly appreciate. There's almost nothing in that calculation. But people don't know it because they have to switch units to the common unit of which people operate in the fossil energy world. $100 a ton of CO2 is $40 a barrel of oil. But we really do know how to think about $40 a barrel of oil in, up and down. It's five million dollars a, a million BTU of natural gas. Well, that is not the only unit of gas, but many of you know it. The U.S. European difference is about that large. So, a hundred dollar ton of CO2 is a, is a price which would get the U.S. gas price to the European one, the European one to the Japanese one, probably as well. And it's two hundred dollars a ton of high quality coal, which makes a coal person just almost faint. Uh, so, it's a great deal higher than the European price. It's a great deal higher than what the diplomats want to talk about. But I think I, I really encourage us to, to ask the fossil energy world to tell us, make a real serious effort, put time into telling us what will various prices produce in the way of activity, investment. They don't know, nobody knows exactly. But we haven't got enough flesh on the bones of what $50, $100, $200 actually produces. My own sense is $100 is the right ballpark for having investments really move, as opposed to being a tax collection mechanism. Um, but we, we can have a serious conversation about that. It is not disabling at the retail level if you have pass-through. So one of the interesting questions around this subject is will, it, will, the, will, the, will the carbon tax be allowed to pass through without additional overheads, in which case the retail impact under a dollar a uh, gallon of U.S. gas, U.S. gas, U.S. gallon of gas, um, uh, is not is not that large. Or four cents a kilowatt hour at a retail price of 15 in New Jersey, when you when you use the gas from uh, electricity, from natural gas, the retail impacts are small, which is why the policies must must affect upstream. The further upstream, the better, because that's where the op options are really really critical. The next two slides are, 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 the, are the paper that Steve Davis and I wrote that was alluded to in the introduction, and which got me this invitation. Um, we, simply, we observed, and actually David Hawkins of the Natural Resources Defense Council put this question to me about 15 years ago, why aren't we noticing the commitments we're making when we build something to future emissions? So that little, uh, the left there you have simply, instead of talking about a power plant is built and 40 years of emissions occur and you think of it as a flat line, Say, no, all of those 40 years are engaged already when you build the thing, because you're not going to turn it off, or unlikely to turn it off. So have a parallel bookkeeping or accounting where you simply declare to the world that I have put 40 billion, 40 years of commitment for emissions in place when I started this power plant of 20 with a car. It gets more complicated and more, and more interesting for people, new work to do to say, well, what about a highway? What about a port? How do you think about less direct consumption? It's all what we're talking about. Is it underlies a lot of the stranded assets. Is how long can it pay off for? And we will have that conversation. So the, when Davis in an earlier paper with Caldera and Matthews had drawn what really is the first picture there on the committed emissions.
which is right now, what are, our, what, are we commi what are we committed to from the power sector alone? It's about 300 million tons of CO2, which is a roughly a decade of today's total emissions. And then we said, well, what if you run the, run the clock back? What were the total emissions in, in two years ago, six years ago, 20 years ago? Committed emissions. And to our surprise, it never went down. In principle, it would go down. Because if you don't build anything new, all of the plants you're running have one year less of commitment a year later. So the number can go down. In fact, if you look closely at the curve with the yellow is the U.S., the U.S. actually did have a period when our committed emissions went down. Um, because we weren't building much on our plants from getting a year older in the year. Um, but as, as uh, I've alluded to in the, one of the morning talks, for the last 12, the 12 years, we've been, that committed emission number has been growing 4% a year. And although people are eager to say that coal has seen its best day, what Steve and I found in this, in this was that coal is doing extremely well in Asia. China has, is over its peak, but other countries are moving right behind it. The coal industry knows this. Another way of seeing this is in the IEA uh, data. They showed that the last decade was the first one in about six, where the carbon intensity of the energy system grew. Like coal gained on gas instead of gas gaining on coal. We don't see that in, in Europe and the U.S. Uh, but we sure do, do see it when we look at global numbers. And so the low carbon industrialization of the developing world is the number one issue in any of these, in any of these cases. And um, it plays in, of course, to the question of whether we will, are we going to strand assets because we have policies strong enough to uh, make them stranded. And it's not at all clear that if we aren't going to move Asia off of coal-based development, that we'll actually have a lot of momentum toward, toward the policies that freeze, that freeze investments. Uh, in the developer. My final slides bring in, bring in a different way of looking at it, and, and my own sense that, that not only are we not likely to make two degrees, but maybe we actually don't want to. The question is, what, what, I, what I really think we underestimate is that there are no good solutions. In fact, I think almost every solution is potentially dangerous. We need to talk much more about conditionality than we do, and every one of these options wedges that we talked about 11 years ago with Colin I, these options all have a downside. It, I, there was not one mention of the word nuclear power in the entire morning, if I'm not mistaken. And yet low carbon is, and low carbon is equated to fossil energy. It's quite clear that China has no intention, of, has every intention of meeting a low carbon target with nuclear power, playing a large role. We can't keep hiding this from ourselves. And then the question is, what, if, what does it mean to have a lot of nuclear power globally coming in and, as part of the deal to meet a tough carbon target? And I think we'll have a conversation about this because a couple of people who have been promoting nuclear power as a solution to climate change are here. And what I'm concerned about is that the particular Achilles heel of, of nuclear power, in my mind, is the link to nuclear weapons. The Iran story playing out right now is, is Exhibit A. We really can decouple nuclear power from nuclear weapons, but boy, is that difficult. And if we don't, I don't think we want global nuclear power. So I wish we were linking the climate change objectives with, with, deep, with objectives that focus on the international institution called the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and a whole group of new policies that make nuclear power a possible alternative. Part of the conditionality that I can bring up the other part of the conditionality is about using biological systems to create a low carbon that option. We do that without, without thinking about the ecology, we will do all kinds of stuff, silly things. So indeed, every, 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 car, every low carbon option has a downside, including conservation. If you let your imagination run, you can imagine a, a rampant push toward, toward regim, a regimented approach to conservation that would make us feel that we lost a lot of liberty. Well, it doesn't have to happen, but it could. Renewables have enormous land impacts, as we, as we all know. And clean coal, which is the carbon capture and storage option, I've been very interested, lots of people here talking about it. It's opposed by the environmentalists largely because it keeps coal alive as an option, but we have to you know, bite heart and say, are we willing to do that in order to, to really make some, some progress? I already mentioned nuclear power, and I really should mention geoengineering, which is being talked about on the tables, but out of the meeting. Two degrees brings a lot of stuff we really might not want, because we have so little time to get things done. But, uh, but it's the only game in town. People are very reluctant to break ranks. But pretty soon, we're going to have to talk about 
the next slide talks about a soft landing for Judith Priest after Paris. I am worried that there are, that there are going to be, there's a possibility of a defeatism emerging when it becomes clear that this single goal that has gotten all the attention for about five years, the IPCC completely focused on it in working in the fifth assessment report, that people will say, I, put, I made up this, this quote, we tried for two degrees and failed, let's put carpet aside for a decade and then take another vote. Now, you know better than I, or many of you are much better connected to the business community. Is that outcome far-fetched or not so, not so unlikely? And if it isn't so unlikely, what are we going to do now to sort of prepare the ground for a, a fresh, a fresh, a fresh in conversation that keeps climate change and the focus of people? It's not going to take the form of three degrees versus two. People don't do that. They don't, they don't back away from one goal into a weaker one. We'll find another way to carry on the conversation. But if we talk about it here in terms of three degrees versus two, I really do think it's a different between slamming on the brakes for two degrees and putting on the brakes for three. And that some of the things we really do want to have happen along with dealing with climate change require to a somewhat slower pace. And they are to, to take the, the, the development of the developed world very seriously, to take a very careful look at nuclear power, particularly the link with nuclear weapons, protect the wild biosphere, and to go slow with geoengineering. Those things will not happen without specific attention, and they're probably more consistent with that small rectangle we popped into the previous picture. Finally, I've been trying to say, what's the, what's the, what's the umbrella set of questions that we need to confront? that this is all part of. And I've come up with this phrase, destiny studies, and I've just written an essay that will be published in a couple of months, trying to put some, put some flesh on this idea that we have a new discipline in the room, which talks about how we think about the future, how we discipline our thinking about the future, how we distinguish different time frames into the future. For example, 50 versus 500 years. Sea level rise is more of a, a multi-hundred year play out, Storms and, and, and droughts probably have a decade's strategy, yet they'll look to the decades pay out, yet we're talking about them the same way. And there's a whole set of issues like habitability of the planet, extinction and reversibility, depletion and excess, active intervention, which is geoengineering, obligation to different future generations, what are they and how do they differ depending on how far out those generations are, shrinking aging human populations, and stranded assets. They belong, they're in, a, they're in a large category of a whole field that is going to be invented. There'll be programs and destiny studies at Oxford for sure. Okay, thanks.